This fourth base might be down and down. Oh, down. The tables have turned. It is the end of the year. So Hi, I'm Sean Day9 Plot from Day9 TV, and we're here at MLG Anaheim to get a sense of what the esports community is like. How'd you get into StarCraft 2? Well, I played StarCraft 1 since I was about 14. That's professional StarCraft. That's something that they can do that I can't do. Do you consider yourself the best Protoss player in the world right now? Of course, why not? Thousands of fans will spend the next few days watching the best players in the world compete in a number of tournaments, including the headline event, StarCraft II. For the past 15 years, the esports community has rallied behind this fast-paced, real-time strategy game that pits two players in the heat of futuristic warfare. It not only tests one's speed and agility, but also their knowledge of strategy and tactics. Since StarCraft's inception in the late 1990s, Alliances formed to create dream teams of professional players who have dominated the tournaments as countless opponents from across the globe have vied for the title of StarCraft Champion. The community that is built up around these tournaments has produced not only a thriving fan base, but also several professional StarCraft leagues, numerous esports commentators, and an independent event scene that has spread worldwide. It all started when Blizzard Entertainment decided to make a new real-time strategy game called StarCraft. StarCraft development began in 1996, and while it was a new universe for Blizzard Entertainment, it was based on all the lessons learned from their previous RTS games, Warcraft and Warcraft II. After some experimentation, the company honed in on a clean, isometric game that pit three warring races on a futuristic battlefield, where they must collect resources, Not enough minerals. construct a base, I read you. build up an army, oh, yeah. and then find and destroy their opponents. Go ahead, Whether choosing the scrappy Terrans, ferocious swarming Zerg, or the powerful enigmatic Protoss, players fight for strategic positions on the map, looking for any opportunity to take advantage of a strength or an opponent's weakness to get ahead in the battle. But when the expansion pack for StarCraft I was released, Blizzard developers began noticing a change in the player community. Paul Sams, our COO, was out in Korea and he came back with pictures of people dressing up like Hydralisks and Protoss units and Terran units, and suddenly it was on a whole nother level. When the original StarCraft was made, it was designed to be a great game, but it wasn't necessarily designed specifically to be an eSport. That was something the community showed us what it could be, how it could be done, and they made that happen. I remember thinking back then that StarCraft was like an interesting game to watch for sure, but it hadn't quite reached eSports level. But when the Koreans started first playing it, guys like Slayers, Boxer, Nada, all those guys, like. Yeah, it, it blew my mind. Those guys took it to a whole nother level. Um, they made it a professional occupation. Watching these players compete with one another at this level that we had not designed the game at, really. We never tested that in these guys' hands moving over the keys and moving the UI so much. I just thought the game was going to crash, you know? These professional gamers were a unique breed. They brought a skill and focus to their game that most other players simply could not. For example, in StarCraft, your APM, or actions per minute, is a quantitative indicator of how fast you can issue commands on the battlefield. Yeah, and his keyboard. Man, he's got so much APM, he broke his keyboard. That's gonna hardcore. Do a little bit of emergency surgery. Professional players could maintain up to 300 actions per minute during an entire match of StarCraft. That's five keystrokes every second for matches that can last for over an hour. StarCraft is absolutely a game of inches. It's not like when you get blown out, you were actually that much worse. You, were just, you just made a few, you know, few mistakes that you shouldn't have made, and, and now you're going to get to lose maybe big. As StarCraft's popularity grew in Korea, new players came from many other countries to compete for the glory of being the best in the world. Watching these guys play is just is absolutely inspiring. And, you know, they're, in many ways, they're all our favorites. Like, it's just amazing to watch these guys play. But it wasn't just the pros who were pushing the limits of the game. PC bongs, or gaming cafes, 
sprang up all over Korea, giving amateur players an opportunity to compete with each other, strategize, and learn the secrets of the pros. This fueled the rise in popularity and skills of the players and drove StarCraft Esports even further into the global mainstream. It was really great to see everyone, you know, really rally behind the players, get really excited. And that's when I feel like esports really started to take off outside of Korea, where it had always done pretty well. In 2007, at the Blizzard Worldwide Invitational in Seoul, Korea, fans were in for a surprise with the announcement of Blizzard's newest title, StarCraft II. StarCraft II was released in 2010 to much praise. While it continued the same storyline from the original StarCraft, it would also soon become the standard RTS game for competitive esports. With StarCraft II, you know, we looked at the game from the beginning and said, okay, we want this to be an esport. We want to make it successful. So, you know, let's focus on things like readability, esports balance, on esports features. The game was built for this. The game was constructed thinking about things like broadcast, observer mode, being able to tell the story of what's going on, not just in-game, but also then latching into the historical stories of the players. But StarCraft II has really been able to reach out to a, a bigger audience, a broader audience. More sponsors are getting involved, more uh, companies and restaurants, and lots of additional interest is coming into StarCraft II. I think with StarCraft II, it, it has shown that it's really expanded out to become an international phenomenon. I said to everybody in the company, I was like, StarCraft II is going to be our flagship game. It is, it's the first time we've had something that's got the built-in community and the tools that we're going to be able to do exactly what we've always you know, dreamt of. Over the last few years, there have been a number of star players to rise from the ranks and show off their particular skills, strategies, and unique playing styles to become StarCraft champions. And there's people out there whose full-time job is to play StarCraft or to prepare StarCraft or, or, or whatever. And it's just amazing to imagine people are creating careers out of this game. And it's, it's, it's extremely humbling. It really has changed my life. It's given me a job. It's given me, it's given me everything I wanted. Like, it's allowed me to travel to the US. It's allowed me to travel the world. And our dream was to travel the world, to see different people, and to compete on the biggest stages. And now in StarCraft II, we're able to do that. I mean, I'm in Anaheim now, and I'm going to be in Sweden soon. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a dream come true. Fruit dealer. Here's this guy who was very passionate about the game, practiced it a lot, and basically was helping his family pay the, the bills by selling fruit. His name, Fruit Dealer, came from this story, and he, as a pro gamer, made a bunch of money out there, got a chance to fly out to the US. All these things came from his skills in, in playing this game. All of the energy these guys are pouring into this game and pouring into the entertainment that they're creating around this game is, is absolutely amazing. And there's one other thing that's guaranteed to be oh, fantastic, yeah? DJ Wait. Just a, a little strategy game by the name of StarCraft II! Pro players aren't the only ones to benefit from the rise in esports. Professional shoutcasting has become as popular as playing the game itself. Well, StarCraft kind of became my life. You know, I moved to Korea uh, to pursue commentating, actually. And after following the Korean scene, I knew that StarCraft was what I wanted to do with my life. So I just continued yeah. on and on and on. I had made 800 videos in a year, so I don't know the math on that. It's a couple videos every day for an entire year. I absolutely loved it. And it's what I would spend almost all my free time doing because I totally enjoyed it. It was a hobby. It was almost by luck, I don't know, an accident, a happy accident, that my coaching was all done via audio. Eventually, one of the teammates said, hey, uh -huh. you should do this like it's a sports cast. And I yeah. did, and sort of that was that. So StarCraft's like actually like who I am. It's, it's it's really transformed the way that I see the world. Uh, and that's from the way the game works now, it challenges yeah. me, and then also outside of the game, how that's impacted the, the way that my life is set up. Since the countdown has begun, oh I am God. so stoked. Game, it's game nine. time. Live events have seen a tremendous rise in attendance across all continents. There are now dozens of live, major esports events taking place around the world each year, with the largest tournaments attracting as many as 20,000 or more attendees. You think about the first uh, events that we saw with StarCraft II, where, you know, there's a good amount of people, but then the people uh, uh, in the community were like, well, gosh, I want to be a part of that. And yeah. then they came, and then they told their buddies, and they wanted to be a part of that, and it truly seemed like a snowball effect. Just the energy that happens in these big forums when you get all of these gamers together to watch a game they really love is just, 
it's, it's absolutely amazing. Last year at MLG Anaheim, like I went and I got to watch live and it was, it's like standing room only. There's like so many people there watching StarCraft. The Boxer versus Rain game went for like over an hour and a half. And like there was this epic battle and everyone was on their feet just screaming at like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is going on. To see that many people excited about StarCraft 2 and esports and then to feel like I was part of it, oh, that was, that was epic. And that's the thing is this ability to create these moments where you say, I was there when. I was there when, you know, Huck won after the Koreans had been involved. I was there when Boxer played his first match in Anaheim. At the Spring Arena 1, it was MKP versus Don Gregu. It was game seven, and it was tense. And the spawn positions were not favored for Don Gregu, so the casters were like, oh no, he's gonna be really upset. I mean, let's talk about these right, spots. Yeah, I, 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 when Marine King finds out where DRG is, he is actually just going to dance, man. And then he goes for this Baneling bust. It's a really high risky strategy. Oh, oh my All right, God. here we go. This is probably going to be decided right this second. The whole bar is holding their breath. They're like, oh my God, oh my God, is the Baneling's going to work. DRG, amazing play here, breaking through. And then it worked in DRG 1 and beat MKP for the first time. Everything just exploding. Just a moment. G. Oh, and DRG, he breaks the curse. He is overwhelmed. DRG has slain a legend. The changes that happen in the strategy across the game, it's really, it's all them. You know, we, we put in units and we try to make them clean and solid and, and have a clear role, but we have no idea how many guys actually could use any of these things exactly. We can make some guesses, but they frequently show us what is possible. I think one of my favorite game moments would be uh, Nesty's use of sort of advanced spine crawlers in a game against a Protoss player where he, he blocked a fast expand by putting creep in front of the Protoss player's base. And I had no idea what he was doing. I don't think the casters knew what he was doing. This is important. Uh, What's happening? What is he doing? Uh, Try to predict it because I actually do not know what he's doing. And suddenly there was these spine crawlers all in front of this next. It was absolutely awesome. Oh, oh my, my god! god! Oh my god, Nesty! That's the coolest thing I've ever seen! has a trillion IQ! I have never seen this before in my entire life. This game has so much depth and so much going into it that you didn't just sit down and play. It's not a DDR where like, you're gonna dance your feet to a different song. This is, every single game is independent event where you're playing against, sure, maybe a similar opponent, but there's yeah. so many different factors that go into it that every game is individual. You know, baseball is always baseball. And baseball at Yankee Stadium between the Yankees and the Red Sox is always that game, but it's not. Each game is new and fresh. Of course, all of the drama associated with a match between two players, whether it's your favorite player, your most hated player, or whatever, is incredibly exciting, and that's always fresh. You don't know what's gonna happen. You're excited to see the result. It's a sport in that sense. That's what any competitive activity, any sport, that's a beautiful thing about this. And every single time we have these events, we create those moments, both for the people in the room, the thousands of people who show up, but also the hundreds of thousands who tune in. With the help of new technology, millions of people have viewed tournaments in over 200 countries. Major League Gaming alone broadcast over 15 million hours of Pro Circuit content in 2011. In this same year, Blizzard hosted seven regional tournaments and televised the finals at BlizzCon with thousands of live spectators. I think that the growth of esports in general is simply related to changing tastes in media. This generation is into demanding the exact content they want and not settling for yeah. anything less. The internet, streaming, YouTube VODs can provide all of that to them with a huge amount of variety available. They can pick their exact taste in commentator. Yeah, yeah. You can't even do that in real sports. We can get these games easily all over the world. And, and, and you know, people like MLG and GSL, they do this all the time where they get, you know, people from 180 countries or something insane watching these broadcasts. 500,000 people tuning in at one time during the day, millions of people over the course of a weekend, 175 countries. It's just the scale is there now because that passion that was evident in those small pockets of community in the beginning was, was, that was those were the seeds. And they've yeah. grown and they've spread, and, and now you see so much more of that. Just as the StarCraft community helped promote esports in the past, fans today take the lead in transforming local bars to create BarCraft events. There, StarCraft II matches litter the screens to create even more excitement in local communities. I want to say hi to Andrew from Star Nation at the Austin BarCraft. What's up, guys? <laughs> having beers, having cheers, and watching some amazing StarCraft II. I think you could really see things change once BarCraft started to happen. 
idea that, you know, you probably could have told someone six years ago that you're crazy, like <laughs> that'll never happen, but look at what, you know, there's like 60 bar crafts just this yeah. weekend. You know, when there's a big tournament, I usually look and see if there's a local bar craft here in Irvine, and, and uh, it's a lot of fun watching the games live with other other uh, fans of the sport. There's a ton of different types of people that come to these. There's the hardcore StarCraft fans who are staying up till four in the morning, and then there's the more casual crowd who just love the idea of watching StarCraft and having a beer. It's just a good gathering place. Everyone everyone shares a common interest. Eventually, I just met all these guys, and so I kept up to date with StarCraft and uh, especially StarCraft after that. It's a great feeling to be around those who, who love the game. Um, and can come out and uh, support and watch all these, uh, these great games that some people might not have access to. Ultimately, the sport grew because of the passion in the community and the experiences they shared with one another. The esports community is, I think, at the height that I've ever seen it. You know, the community has always been the forward pushers, and I think right now the community realizes, yeah. you know what? As a collective, we've got a lot of power. I think it just comes down to straight up passion from the community. Without that, you can't really have esports. It's just, it's not possible. Yeah. StarCraft and Blizzard games, in fact, Blizzard games in general wouldn't be where they are because it's the community uh -huh. that kind of guide Blizzard. It's, it's their feedback that allows Blizzard to then kind of know what what is gonna make this the best game. That's what it's all about, is bringing the community together, supporting them, and giving them you know, something that they can rally around. Something that they can all come together around and say, you know what, this thing is a great representation of something we love. There's a secret cult of people out there that want to see this just get as big as it can possibly be. You know, guys like Tasteless and Artosis and GSL, you know, guys like Day9, and, and, then, and then just gamers everywhere, guys doing bar crafts. We want to change the world. We want to see if we can make this a thing that is something that is, the, the, you know, the sort of the entertainment for the 21st millennium. And, and we feel like we're on the cusp of doing it. We feel like, kind of smell the potential for victory here, smell the potential to break into the mainstream, get to a point where I can turn on ESPN, you know, on a Saturday night and watch, you know, a great game of StarCraft. You know, wouldn't that be absolutely awesome? With an amazing, creative, and proactive esports community, the future looks very bright. Well, we just had an awesome day here at MLG Anaheim, and with a few more matches to go, we're all about to tune in. So wherever you are, do enjoy Heart of the Swarm and keep spreading the esports love. Find Kerrigan. Blizzard is known for these uh, just amazing pre-rendered cinematics, but the limitation there is that since they're so complex, that it's, it's difficult to create a lot of footage. In-game cinematics function as this really cool supplement. Basically, we make movies using the game engines. We can iterate very quickly. You get a lot of flexibility and freedom from the speed at which we can work. That also allows us more freedom to experiment and collaborate. Basically, we can do a lot more with a lot less. It just helps us develop more story, gives the players more content. We're able to tell different kinds of stories as well. Probably the one of the best tool we have to tell story. Well, the whole series is about Kerrigan's journey from being the Zerg. Her love story was Jim Rayner and how she dealt with a Mansk. We have nine stories to tell to bring her from this point to this point. I mean, she goes through like this crazy roller coaster ride, chasing after people and killing people, and she's just like hell bent on revenge. But Jim Rayner, he's trying to convince her not to or to give up the hate, the revenge, but they got separated and, and she went on a war path. The cinematics department works very closely with the game team to come up with first scripts, then storyboards. We use storyboards as a kind of a gateway 
into showing people what we're working on. They give an idea of the depth and of where the camera is supposed to be and where the characters are supposed to be. And we create a, a 2D animatic, which is basically a sequence of storyboards linked up together with music, sound effects. We, we rough out a tremendous number of um, iterations and we just keep throwing new ideas out. The iteration is, is, is just part of the job. That allows us to experiment and come up with new ideas to try to tell it the sequence as well as we can. Things will change on the game side, which will change what happens on a cutscene on our end. The story drives it so quickly that oftentimes we just sketch and just doodle very quickly. It's really about coming with the best, best story. Once we have that, we start working on animation, creating models, and putting together a scene. Previs is the first stage after the storyboards. Taking our 2D cinematics, 2D storyboards, and put it in a 3D environment. So we can start to get a feel for the staging, the blocking, the pacing. We work out the cameras, most of the actions, a uh, little bit of animation. In the case of Kerrigan, we will place her into the scene in such a way that it exaggerates her moods, her feelings. Basically tell the story within the shot. Uh, what, what's the story? What's the main point? Yep. Like riding a bike. Amon Temple, actually, we took a very, very uh, simple approach. We shot it as much we could as a live action sequence. We plot out the entire sequence, all the animation, in a very crude, uh, sim simple manner. We would treat the environment as a set and we would have the characters staged out and say, OK, here are our actors. And then once that's done, we just go into our, our InnerSense room, which is our, our motion capture camera room. We would have Ben hold the camera. He could actually just take that virtual camera and move around it and shoot it. So that the um, shots that we create are more exciting and more um, alive. What this process brought us, or, or show me, is that even though this place is huge, this, this temple is huge, we're not going to see a whole lot. So with those information, I went with a more simplistic approach to the temple. He told you of ruin, extinction. For the Zalnaga set, it was kind of a, a different look. So we kind of wanted to create something that had a little bit more of a mystical feel rather than a futuristic or, or a visceral feel. What we did was we actually looked at old temples, super old temples. We wanted to get that ancient feeling. So we were trying to do a lot of uh, stone um, uh, inlaid with metal. We looked at a lot of like ancient Egyptian references. But it needed to be extremely, extremely sci-fi. Open the door, son. Valerian's orders, sir. No visit. Open the door. We did the lab very first. It was one of the biggest set we ever built. We had Kerrigan in a laboratory. And it's like a medical environment. So we looked at a lot of like uh, sci-fi movies, you know. And we kind of just kind of wanted to see what do we want from this lab to be. We wanted it to be super high tech, but at the same time, we also wanted it to be a prison. There was a lot of variety in the different types of pieces that were in the set. From the elevator to the screen to the cell room Kerrigan's in and even the, the door. I think that uh, we were definitely thinking about just making something that was sterile to kind of get across this vibe that she's undergoing a lot of testing. Simple shapes in the tech and in the, in the environment, a lot of lighter colors. And then just try to combine all that into this, call it fortress, that kind of just built just for Kerrigan. Believe. Behold, Zerus. When, when Zera 2 show a vision of what Zerus is, there's two primal Zera creatures running around, basically hunting each other. The idea behind the primals was this was the, the Zergs on their home planet before they were altered. We wanted to make them like they could hold their own against the old Zerg and maybe even more. Prehistoric Zerg, you know, more like dinosaur versions of the Zerg. They're embodiments of the, the, the pure DNA that makes them what they are. So it's a very nice change from going into that very insectoid Zerg into the more, you know, natural kind of Zerg. So we didn't want that feeling that they were dirty or grungy or anything like that. They were much more pure. They fight. They evolve. 
evolve. We create all these like Zerg creatures. We have to know how they move. We have these really cool concepts, and we assume they're awesome in the, for animation. But now we have a previous department, and so that helps out a lot. When we get the scenes, we just start animating without having to worry about other other things. The hardest part is actually pushing the animation a little bit further, like style-wise. We did a lot of reference for it. You got to do a lot of reference just to actually bring that to life, because if you try to do it thinking about it in your head, it's going to be really difficult. A lot more went into it. We worked in conjunction with the animators, and we made a system where they can essentially make the facial expressions that they need and get those into the rig quickly. There's a lot more, there's a lot of emotional stuff going on in, in Heart of the Swarm. I think the rigs really gave the, gave the animators the ability to tell that story in a much more effective way. It's really down to really subtle details in the face. So we try to push the facial expressions a lot, and then for us, just the general silhouette, the pose is very important. She's still fundamentally human, so making that silhouette that again is covered in spikes, like all the Zerg creatures, read sad or compassionate takes a little bit more work. Her attitude to her animation gets the more and more intricate. Because this is Kerrigan's campaign, we really had to step it up and make sure she looks awesome. For the most part, she's this badass chick who's gonna go kick everyone's butt. She definitely has her own way that she holds herself. Her walk is different, and then she, she grew high heels. In the last cutscene that we did, we couldn't quite get the uh, the feel of a woman. Everything that we did, all the walks and all the stances, it was kind of like, it felt like a guy doing it, not really like a woman doing it. So we had to call in uh, Tina, and she has heels and was wearing her heels and had the feel that we wanted. Face me, rude. We had to come up with the desert Kerrigan. So we had to come up with the whole phase of what she looks like as not ghost Kerrigan, but almost like a prisoner Kerrigan. From the last game, we had like a Zerg version of her and we had to sort of like humanize her face, trying to um, incorporate uh, textures that were more friendly, you know, and then... Oh, obviously her dreads. We kept her dreads from um, Winds of Liberty. We had to hit certain look for, for when she was a ghost. At the same time, you know, it's Kerrigan, you know, she's got to be sexy, she's got to be hot, so a lot of effort went into actually designing the suit, you know, make sure she looks good in that. Still want to tell people that she's not fully ghost because we associate ghosts kind of with that blue, bluish glow. So I'll give her that orange glow. It's mostly all about color uh, as far as her display of her power. It just goes from being subtle to over the top crazy. We start with her being more ghost oriented. So we're looking to like more psionic so she can lift off people, um, crush objects. You don't want to see her powers, but kind of hint her potential. Because at, at the point, you don't know that she's going to turn into Zerg again. As the story progresses, she kind of like evolves back into, she becomes a Queen of Blades again. And this is after she goes to Zerus and she gains her powers back. We started looking into more Zerg power. How does she use her wings? How does she incorporate the swarm into, into her fight? Everything, just all hell breaks loose at that point. She transforms, and all of a sudden now she's a more badass Kerrigan. She controls all Zerg now. She got the bioluminescent pattern on her body, her face. Her colors are subtly changing to more saturated purples and more deeper colors. The color represents pretty much uh, her mood. When Kerrigan gets upset, she amplifies her power through, you know, we visualize it through her bioluminescence, kind of glows a little bit more. The mood of the lighting and the, all the effects, everything ties in together pretty, pretty nicely. What have you done? What I had to. We're a team that tries to get as much value for the work that we do as we can. We want to be great storytellers, be able to, to churn out a lot of story. And we pour a lot of love a lot of our sweat and, and blood into these cinematics. And I think it definitely shows. I think people are really going to like it once it gets out into the wild. It's pretty impressive the amount of work that such a small group puts out. It's scary and daunting at first, but we, we all had a lot of fun.
The VO process is not one that a lot of people have a lot of visibility into. The world of voiceover is, is really exciting and very in-depth. Good voiceover is like a breeze blowing through. You don't even notice it because it feels so real and natural. I think a lot of people think that voice acting is, oh, it's so simple because you just show up, you can show up in your pajamas. But what people don't realize is so much work goes into that. And I just don't think people think that. I think they hear the lines and they kind of move on with the experience of the game. And I think the great thing about that is, is if they're not paying attention to it, then we did our job. So the first step that we take in voiceover is really talking about our characters. There's a whole lot of, of brainstorming and collaboration that goes on. We spend a lot of time early on in story meetings really discussing you know, the arcs of these characters. Because it's very important to us that our characters experience life just as we do. If you don't believe these characters, you know, to believe how they're reacting to things or the plausibility of their plight, then it's all for nothing. Then the next step is casting. Sir, Dominion ships warping in. Manx's flagship is leading them. Sweet mother of mercy. I make a, what I call a casting document that really highlights everything we're looking for for a character. I send it out to all the voiceover agents. We get a ton of applicants. We're always kind of looking for people that can come in and really just, you know, tap a, a certain chord, a certain emotional resonance. Because if you get the right person, matched up to that right role, you have pure magic. It's kind of that one of those things that when it's right, everybody knows it. We all just sort of look at each other and there's no, it's a no-brainer. Nicely done, stand by. A whole lot of work goes into that first day of recording. And I've got to say, voice actors on video games are my heroes. You know, these poor actors go through hours of torture with us. They come to the recording studio not really knowing a whole lot about what they're doing, and we all sit down and talk on the couch. They'll talk about the storyline, what's going to happen to this character in game, we look at artwork together. To see someone's conception of the come to life of what the character was, was just totally inspiring. Yeah, all those drawings, all that helps because it gives you a place to, to start as an actor. Voice actors come into a recording studio with no props, no set, no hair and makeup, no other actors, and they perform. I think sometimes when the actor comes in and really inhabits a character, there's things you hear in the character that you didn't really hear before. How well do you know yourself? You have to draw on your own personal experiences, warts and all. You have to own your character is what you have to do. No matter what we want going into it, no matter how much of, of control freaks we are, the actors always make it their own. Hello, Kerrigan. I've been waiting for you. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't tried to escape. Escape? <laughs> My dear, I'm afraid you've got it all wrong. One of the most important people that I need to have with me in recording is the writer. I, th I think a lot of times as we're scripting video games, I mean, so often you're trying to just make the lines work and, and bring out maximum character from, from anyone in the scene. Writing is absolutely crucial, and I think the writing in this game is what gives us all a leg up. Every one of the actors a leg up on their characters. What I was really happy about was that the writers had also created so much more there to work with as a performer. I don't think there are any characters in this game that are boring and bland. From the hero down to the vilest of the villains. Um, that would be me, of course. <laughs> I was called upon to serve the greater interest of humanity. Personal power was never my goal. The character of Manx is always this big anchor for the series. You know, you got all these crazy aliens and um, all these desperate heroes, and you know, Mengsk is right there in the middle, kind of manipulating everything. Mengsk mesmerizes me. He justifies for himself all of the ends that he goes to to save his kingdom and save the people. I wanted him to have just incredible power and weight, even though he wasn't this you know alien demigod. It's just this politician who will go to any length to get what he needs, right or wrong. An actor can't just go out and play, play bad. You can't do that, you know? You have to have some justification. If Arcturus is egomaniacal and if he's doing this all for himself, that's for others to judge. I can't play him that way. Belay that order. We're moving out. Prepare to move away from Tarsonis on my mark. So when James Harper came in, he walked in, just, he was just the man, right? I'm like, whoa, I was a little intimidated. Well, first originally getting cast was 1997. I was really happy to have the job. But once he fell into the character and, and he just started doing this kind of Virginian thing, you know, my fellow Terrans, right? He just owned it and it just started pouring out of him like molasses. I assure you, this criminal 
will be brought to justice. Whatever I thought the character would sound like and whatever I wanted him to feel like in terms of the script, James just put it just over the moon. It was, I just remember thinking that how cool is this? <laughs> how, how much fun is this to do? And I had no idea. It would, at the time, it would go to where it is today. I was really excited to get James back in. You, you know, 10 years on, it was a you know, little more grit, a little more vocal texture to his voice, and it was just perfect. I love your gumption, son, but you been way over your head. What makes you think you have the experience to? He ain't alone, Arcturus. Reyna. You know, when we cast Wings of Liberty, it had been many years um, since the original StarCraft game. We were all kind of wondering, you know, how the original cast would do. It had been something like 10 years. In the case of uh, Rainer, there was a time there where we were really looking at the character and talking about who he was and how he, he's going to evolve in these new chapters. When I did the first game back in 1998, I was really not aware of the impact that StarCraft had. I, you know, basically it was a, it was a job for me. You know, the, the game hasn't been out in a long time. Um, should we be thinking about kind of like stars to come in? You know, people with some, you know, some name cred on the street. It wasn't really that we wanted to move away from him. It was just that we were looking to broaden like his scope. What was interesting about coming back 10 plus years later was that there was obviously going to be an evolution to the character. We listened to all these different actors and uh, we just realized that uh, the original guy nailed it. He got into that booth and just killed it. I moved to heaven and earth to bring you back, Sarah. I never gave up on you, Sarah. Don't you give up on us. And every time we looked at the art and we heard Robert's voice, it just, it was perfect. I get a second chance at, at being part of the experience. Robert will find things for Jim Rayner that we didn't expect. Because we have, maybe we haven't yet thought out about Jim's reaction or thoughts to this. He's, he's incredibly human. And I think that's one of the things that people identify with him. It's not guaranteed that he's gonna succeed. He's come from a very, very tough life. And as a person, I've been there. I've, I've been to those dark places. I've been depressed, sad. I've had loss in my life. And you just allow all of that to come to the surface. Titus, what have you done? I made a deal with the devil, Jimmy. We all got our choices to make. I'm so glad that he came back in because he is just the heart of the whole thing. And just that, that, that texture and richness of Rainer's voice, just uh, it's just kind of this anchor point through the series. To wake up in the morning and know that I get to go down to the studio and be the voice of Jim Rainer, I mean, come on, to be honest with you, that doesn't suck. The killing will never stop until Minsk is dead. I'm going to make him pay. That's enough of that. It's the sound of the voice that tells you almost more about who that character is. With Kerrigan, you know, with so many different layers to her, you know, she's maybe the most complex character in any of our Blizzard storylines. My first thoughts of this character that there was going to be, it was going to be so much fun because there was such a wide range. We knew that this was a very tragic character. Uh, so in Wings of Liberty, we got to see her being left behind and being abducted by the Zerg. And then we also knew that she was going to evolve into this Queen of Blades, this very vicious, cunning figure. And we needed someone who could play both sides. So it was just such, such a vast array that as an actor, you want those type of roles. You know, when we had Trisha come in and audition, you know, she just hit a, like a, a vocal sound that just broke our hearts. Jim, are you out there? I need you. I need you to hear me right now. She's just such a well-rounded character, which you don't often see in video games. You often see you're the, the good character, you're the fighter, you're the evil, you're the alien, the, you're this, and she's, she's now all of it. You know, of all these changes that she goes through um, and all the emotional layers that she goes through, it was critical that, you know, you had a voice that could ease you into all of that. Now in Heart of the Swarm, she's, she's been desergified. She doesn't really, she remembers some things, but not everything. So there's a lot more vulnerability because she's lost. She's, you know, a, a, a woman who's been really beat around by life, you know, and is desperate to kind of find her core. There's a mission to her and, and, and to her life and where she has to go. But there is, there is so much vulnerability to who she is. She doesn't know who she is anymore. She's, she's strong, but she's got all this guilt and, and anger bubbling. The lawless terrorist James Rayner is dead. 
the sound of her needs to be very, very specific and the range of emotions we you know, can project are gonna be very, very specific. The voice isn't that different. It's not like, I'm sweet for Kerrigan and I'm mean for Queen and you know, I'm somewhere in between. It's, it's the same, it's just the intention. But you do try it different ways and, and then it just, the character develops from that. I'm coming for you, Minsk, and you won't have any hybrid to protect you. She needs to sound human above all else. You know, she needs to sound like just someone that could live next door. We felt that Trish has just absolutely hit that and really brought you know, a level of emotionality to Kerrigan that is, that is critical in terms of the end user, the, the player ultimately really identifying with the character. Kerrigan is such a story. I just find it really, really intense, her story in this game. So I, I can't wait to get the fan reaction from, from Heart of the Swarm. For I am the queen of the lanes.